G'day folks and welcome to this uh, tier ranking of GMT Games publications. Now I'm a big fan of these tier ranking systems. I've been watching people rank fruit and vegetables and meats um, and books and movies and I thought well let's do one for GMT Games. Um, <clears throat> A few caveats to come with this. Now, first of all, according to Board Game Geek, uh, Dream Team Games have published 565 totals. I am going to cover 75 of those titles. Now, I'm I'm cutting out expansions, so I, I may be covering some base games like Commands and Colors, but I'm not covering all the Commands and Colors expansions. Uh, I'm not covering any of the expansions, as far as I'm aware, for any of the games I'm looking at here. I've cut it down to 75 titles, and these are the titles that I'm um, most familiar with. I may have dabbled in other titles not covered here, but I wanted to make sure that I had some, um, some grasp for these games, some solid foundations. So there are still 480 odd, 90 odd titles that I'm not covering, but uh, yeah, these are the games that I've, I've played, familiar with, and confident assessing by my standards. Now, what are these standards by which I'm judging? Um, first and foremost, uh, is it a good game? Where does it rank in game system? I've just noticed A, B, C, D. There we go, fixing up the tier system. Um, yeah, is it a good game for, does, does it achieve its objectives um, for its weight, for its audience? Now, this is hard to do because how do you compare a game like Battle Line against a game like Three Days of Gettysburg? Um, they have completely different purposes, completely different ends of the spectrum, completely different play times, etc. I am trying to judge Battle Line as a light card game and Three Days of Gettysburg as a very heavy and complex game. So, you know, I'm not necessarily using the same criteria. I'm sort of questioning. You know, does this game achieve kind of what it set out to achieve? Um, does it does it satisfy its audience, potential gamers for that particular type of market? Uh, that's my main consideration here, and I'm trying to you know f be be flexible with weightings and complexity and um, time to play and things like that. The um, the games have kind of been randomised, so you know downloaded all the images, threw them all into this uh, tier software. And um, this is how it spat them out. So I'm going to start in this order with Sekigahara, um, The Unification of Japan, published in 2011 by Matt Culkins. I still have the first edition. Uh, there have been several versions where they've increased the box size over the years. After the fifth printing in 2022, I still have the first edition. What a fantastic block game. Um, Every time I sit down and play this, I kind of forget how to play it and forget what I'm doing, but end up having a lot of fun. You have to get the right units with the sort of the right cards in at the right time, and you never really know what you're doing. It feels a bit like rock, paper, scissors, um, but that's just my inexperience and clumsiness every time I sit down to play it. Um, it's always a fun experience. It's always relatively easy to get back into. Um, what do we say? But basically, mid weight complexity 2.79 out of 5. It plays fairly quickly. I'd say two to three hours, two-player game, hidden block information, but really lovely block art, as you can see in some of these images on the top right. Um, I am going to put this... Where do I start? You know, what's my standard for ranking? I'm going to put this in the B tier. Um, I'm usually not a huge block game fan, but this feels like... It just doesn't feel like most block games. It feels so different. Um, it's pretty chaotic. I don't think it really captures the um, the Senjoku Jedi era, um, but it's 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 a good game nonetheless. And for a light to medium weight game, I think it yeah does very well. Let's move on to Crown and Roses, and I've reviewed Crown of Roses. And I've done some playthroughs of Crowns of Roses. I said at the time that I think this is an underrated game. Six point six rating, three point nine eight complexity. I think it's. It's dealt with harshly because it is a heavy, complex game that brings a lot of mechanics together. Um, and you need to have a group of dedicated players who can play this several times. It falls within the realm of Here I Stand, where it's hard to teach a new player Here I Stand and sit them down for an 8, 9, 10 hour game. Crown of Roses, 
goes for probably 14, 16 hours. You're looking at a whole weekend to play it. Um, <clears throat> 3.98 waiting. It's a complex game. It's a long game. I think 300 minutes is a vast underestimate and it has a big learning curve because you're teaching block game rules. You're teaching card driven mechanics rules. You're teaching area control rules. Um, you're teaching um, bidding and diplomacy rules as well. There's just a lot going on that makes it difficult to play. I think it's a good game, but those barriers, ah, it's, um, I'm trying to think now, where does this go? And I'm leaning towards the C tier, despite, I, I like it, I enjoy playing it, but it is very difficult to get to the table. So in terms of considering what this tries to do to get ideally four people to the table, it is very difficult to do so. Um, so I'm putting this in the C tier. Um, but but if you can get if you've got those four players who can play over a weekend, jump at it. Um, yeah, everything works together nicely. I'll talk more about that. I, I do talk more about that in the review. Okay, Commands and Colors Ancients. Look, this I love this game. This game got me started. This is probably one of the first GMT games I ever um, bought uh, and played, and it really was the game that provided me with a gateway to the hobby. Lightweight. Um, Commands and Colors, Ancients. Uh, it, I believe, was the first in this kind of series um, of campaign battle card driven games. You had Battle Law coming out a, a fair way a couple of years later, which I picked up because I love Commands and Colors, Ancients. So many expansions to this, and again, I've just covered the base game here. Um, it's it's almost borderline S tier for me because. It has such a profound impact on this sort of genre within the hobby. Um, uh, yeah, what more can I say? It's a classic. Uh, if you've never played Commands and Colors Ancients, please jump at it. The weighting is, it's much lighter than that. I would put this at a 1.6, 1.7, 1.8. It's definitely lightweight, um, but a lot of fun, very tactical, easy to play, but yeah, really some, some interesting strategies going on. All right, next one, Andy and Abyss, um, coin game. Uh, number two, I want to say, in the coin series, is it volume two? Volume two, where will I find that information? Uh, it's right behind me, on the shelf behind me, so I should just turn around and have a look. I was hoping I'd see it here somewhere. But look, um, we actually haven't played this very often. Um, we came into coin quite late and um yeah uh, what can i say about this one it's um an easier coin game to play um that hasn't really i'm gonna put this in the c tier because it hasn't didn't just grab our attention as much as other coin games so i'm really comparing with other coin games here it's a, a good lighter weight coin game what's it say on the 3.78 i think it's easier than that but maybe that game this is the context here we've played most of the coin games, and this is certainly one of the easier ones that we found to play. But at the same time, we didn't find it um, as interesting as some of the coin, other coin game titles, which you'll see coming up soon. Moving on to and the Napoleonic Wars. Um, fascinating theme, really great to play the Napoleonic Wars with some friends. You're playing out the full war. Uh, it just felt diplomacy was frustrating. Um, I'm putting this in the C tier as well. Um, Napoleonic Wars, look, a great experience, the Napoleonic Wars, I can't recall what edition I have here, but uh, here's the second edition from 2008, Mark McLaughlin design, um, really, you know, fantastic um, card driven, multiplayer card driven game, um, but much like the criticisms I'll raise with Here I Stand, um, relies on people at the table knowing the game well, engaging in careful diplomacy. Um, it's a game where, yeah, there can be swings of luck. It tells a good story, but ultimately you should be approaching this as a sort of a, not a historical simulation, but as sort of an ex experiencing the Napoleonic Wars. Um, to that extent, I think it just falls slightly short of B. T. I'm putting it just at the high C T here. If I could add a C plus, this would be C plus, maybe even a B minus. 
Okay, Fading Glory. Now I no longer own this, but I used to play it a lot and loved it. Um, great introduction to um, Napoleonic Warfare. It kind of was inspired by, yeah, Napoleonic 20 multi-pack volume. So there's these uh, Napoleonic Waterloo 20 um, type of games. You've got 20 counters on a map at uh, 20 units on a map at one time. So you can see here, very, very low uh, unit density, very tactical kind of um, thinking, but on a kind of brigade scale. So here's Borodino, for example, this image here, uh, a couple of units uh, fighting the whole Battle of Borodino. So not a great simulation, but again, a good game and a good introduction to Napoleonics. And I think I went from Fading Glory to, this is my gateway to Napoleonic gaming. I picked this up and then went into the uh, Library of Napoleonic Battles, OSG, and then from there into La Batea. So this got me started. Um, I'm also putting this in the CT. CT is going to be pretty busy. Uh, it wasn't one that I held on to, just as I got dove deeper into gaming, I wanted something more uh, meteor and found that elsewhere. Um, but highly recommended for players looking to get their teeth into Napoleonics. All right, next title is uh, Ted Races, Barbarossa to... Berlin, uh, Barbarossa to Berlin, there we are, World War II, 2002 publication. Uh, I picked this up shortly after buying Paths of Glory and falling in love with Paths of Glory. Paths of Glory should probably come on my list earlier, but this remains a great game. It's um, It tends to be more on the rails compared to Paths of Glory. Um, basically, the Germans need to invade Russia, drive east, and win. And if they don't win early, they're going to struggle. Um, that's the way most of my games, I've played it many times, and most of my games have played out that way, that uh, if the Germans don't win early, they're often not going to win. Once the Allies can stem that tide, if the Soviets in particular can just hold on, they can gradually push the Germans back. Everything else almost seems like a sideshow. Um, the Western Front, North Africa, the Mediterranean theatre. Your focus is my my focus has traditionally been on on the Eastern Front, um, and yeah, you can almost. Uh, I think I've seen a lot of games where the German player just gives up if they don't if they don't win early because you kind of see the writing on the wall. Probably not fair, um, but I'm putting this in the B tier because it's still a lot of fun, car driven game, so much like Paths of Glory, but without maybe. Uh, the same kind of back and forth. It feels like it's, you know, German, huge German advantage, and then it swings heavily toward the Russian advantage, whereas Paths of Glory has a lot more tension running throughout the course of the game. So BT for um, World War II, Barbarossa to Berlin by Ted Racer. The next one is Air Bridge to Victory, a very old um, GMT game uh, designed by Gene Billingsley, published in 1990. Only a 6.3 rating, 3.36 uh, complexity rating. Um, I actually have a review published uh, on Board Game Geek. Uh, it's not a review; it's a playthrough. Um, so, 1990. Keep that in mind. There are a lot of adding up of combat factors. I literally had a calculator, pencil, and paper as I was playing through this game, adding up all the factors, trying to get. You know, this is the era where you're trying to get the best combat odds ratio for every combat. Um, it doesn't hold up all that well. It was interesting to play. It felt very balanced. The Allies just fell short of that final bridge. Um, but I'm putting this in the D tier. Uh, 1990, probably great, but it's been 33 years now and I wouldn't return uh, to it. Um, I think the weight rating is much lighter than that. It's fairly easy to play. Um, some of these images on board game you could probably mine. No, 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 these aren't mine. Um, did I do a video? I think I did a very early video on this as well. No videos online either. So maybe just the, uh, the forum. Top reviews, top playthroughs. There we go, Race Against Time. Check out my campaign after action report. But yeah, look, this doesn't hold up very well. I'm putting this in the D tier. Wilderness War. I used to play a heck of a lot of Wilderness War. Um, I can't remember much about it because it's been so long since I played it. Um, Seven Years War, uh, French and Indian War in North America. Um, great car-driven game. Mm, 
used to had have logged a lot of plays but can't really remember. I'm going putting it in the B tier as a solid card driven game on this theme. Um, it's been released. There was a recent uh, publication. It's originally published 2001, but of course 2015 third edition. Not that I thought it was more recently. Um, designed by Volko Runke. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, precursor to, so you had Wilderness War, then a couple of years later, there was the Martin Wallace game, and everyone started playing that, and this kind of just fell off the radar. I think it saw a comeback, because I've seen a lot of car uh, copies in Australia in recent years. So solid B, solid card-driven game. Right, next, three games of Gettysburg, a, a game that kind of holds a special place in my heart, because this is the game that um, inspired me to start this YouTube channel. Um... Huge, 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 so deep. Richard Berg design, um, inspired by, of course, um, Three Days of Gettysburg, inspired by, um, what's the precursor? Um, I've forgotten. So the, it was Three Days of Gettysburg before Three Days, it's Terrible Swift Sword. Okay, so it came from Terrible Swift Sword. Um, and there is a new edition on GMT's P500 right now. I'm putting this up in the A tier just as an amazing gaming experience for what it does, for cap really capturing the feel of Gettysburg so well on this scale. The rules, are, I mean, it's part of the great battles of the American Civil War series, so the series is brilliant. I have only included, included this, I've only included this title out of the many games I've played on this series. So I know they're not expansions. Um, the other games probably wouldn't be in A rank, they'd be more sort of B, some of them C, but this is the one I played the most uh, played many scenarios, made an attempt at the full campaign, didn't finish it, um, but just a wonderful game experience. And if you ever have the time and patience and table space to play through the full three days of Gettysburg, you, you'll hopefully find that it really captures um, the flow, the ebb and flow of that battle. Um, very well designed and researched and, yeah, credit to Richard Berg. Um, a masterpiece. Uh, Cuba Libre, again, the first in the title. Look, I'll put this in BT because it's the first um, in the coin series. Again, not one that we've played much of. A Distant Plane is going alongside it in the BT as one that my group really likes. Um, uh, can't say much about it. Look, they all tend to blend in after a while. This one... Uh, what are we, US helicopters flying around, transporting US troops, it's interesting. Um, yeah, more solid, more interesting, more thematic than I think both of these. All right, Ardennes 44. I'm putting this in ST. Mark Simonich, um, I think the best of his 1940X series. Fascinating every time I play it. I love studying the map, I love studying the roads. Um, I love looking for exploitations and, and routes to victory. Yeah, the first ST, a great publication by GMT Games. This is this is the I think this is the version I've got. So Ardennes 44, Ardennes 44, The Battle of the Bulge, first published 2006. I have this old version. There have been a few recent editions, second edition and third edition. Um, which do change the rules a bit. They change the, uh, I think, the full retreat rules and things like that. Sort of, uh, I'm throwing straight in the C tier. Look, a great game. Uh, just feels so imbalanced. Um, in fact, I've played it with a fifth player expansion as well. Designed by Ray Farrell. Um, it doesn't, the, the, the factions do not feel balanced and it's very, very difficult to negotiate. Unlike games of Here I Stand where you've got so much to negotiate, what do you, you don't have a lot to give in sort of Rome. It's like, please don't attack me, please don't attack me. I want to survive, please don't attack me. And it's just, it's hard to make a convincing case when you don't have things to barter with. Please don't attack me and maybe I won't attack you for a turn or two. Anyway, um... Look, if you love ancient Rome, card-driven games, it's it's a go-to. Um, but as a card-driven game, I'd probably put it towards the very bottom of the sort of card-driven game experiences. And if you're looking for a game on Rome, I think there are other games like uh, not Republic of Rome. What's the game called? Pax Romana, 
which I think is more interesting. Um, Rise of the Roman Republic, kind of that era. <laughs> Um, so yeah, DT for Sword of Rome. Fire in the Lake. Mm, does it belong in the AT? Yeah, I think it's my favourite. One of my favourites of the Coin series. That perfect balance of complexity and theme. And we've always had such tight finishes. Um, and really interesting Vietnam War. Um, yep, it's going up there in the AT. Haven't played with the expansions. I don't know how many there are now. We've only played the base game, but... Yeah, a great experience every time we've played Fire in the Lake. Empire of the Sun. Wow, this is going to... I, you know, tried to learn how to play it. It's hard to learn this game solitaire. It's not a solitaire game. I know there's, you know, you can, you can, you can do it, but it's very difficult to learn this game without an opponent sitting opposite you. Um, so my experience... This could probably be an S or an AT game if I had a regular opponent to play it with. I don't, so my experience has been clearly huge potential. I'm putting it in BT. It doesn't deserve lower than that because it's an outstanding game design. Um, Empire of the Sun by Mark Herman, of course. Um, it's one of those games that I bought early in roughly 2006, seven. Couldn't learn it, so sold it on um, and then reacquired it with the recent publication. And I've done some videos on the channel as well. So yeah, BT, but if I had somebody to play it with, it'd be AT. That's my ranking system. 1914, Serbian must Serbian. Serbian must die. What a great introduction to this. Um, it's, not intro it's not the first title, but it's a good way to for new players to learn the series that I'm by Michael Resch. What's the series called? The 1914 series, of course. I am <laughs> putting this in the AT. I've only played the I've only played several small scenarios. I've only played the one or once or twice, um, but it was an amazing experience. What a wonderful way to simulate supplies! You really feel like you are <clears throat> making these command and offensive decisions with your supplies in mind. Um, brilliant, brilliant system. I wish I just had the time and the space to explore this system in more detail. Um, 1914, Twilight and the East, going right alongside it there. I'm, I'm jumping ahead, I know, because I want to put that up there as well. Much, much bigger title. And I haven't... I don't have um, the French title here. Uh, the third one. But it would be up there as well. Brilliant designs, very heavy complexity. So this is a 4.06. I have my primer videos, instructional videos, how to play videos. Once you wrap your head around it, it's amazing to look at and think about Highly recommend 1914 Serbian Musturbian and 1914 Twilight in the East. Okay, next one, I just mentioned it, uh, Pax Romana. <clears throat> I loved this game, my friends didn't, because I crushed them. Uh, I played as the Pyrrhus and the Greeks of Southern Italy. Uh, a friend played Rome, another friend played who was he? I think it was Carthage, maybe. Where does this go? Oh, look, we were fr even I was frustrated for the because of the combat mechanics. Richard Burdick's design, um, Pax Romana. Um, it falls into now. Which of these Pax Romanas is it going to be? That one. Here it is. Richard Berg, first published two thousand and six. Um, there is a twenty fifteen second edition. I think I've got the first edition here. I love this, I like the title, I like the games. So many different scenarios, so many different ways to play it. A lot of game in this box, a B plus in this tier. Recommend that. And of course, I'm pretty sure it's part of a broader series, right? The, maybe not. I'm, I thought that uh, Rise of the Roman Republic and Carthage were in a similar series. Please correct me if I'm wrong there. All right, Churchill. Now, I know this is part of a series. I think I have P500. I don't have Versailles, which I probably should because it's kind of in my area of interest. I'm going to put this in the B tier as a solid game that we haven't played enough. I bought this as a three-play game because we often have three friends coming together, um, but we just haven't played this enough. Um, so B tier, but probably deserving of more credit. Um, and of course there is Versailles, and the other one is Triumvir. Are there other titles in that series? Mark Herman designed. The Great Statesman series, 
Pericles, of course. Pericles, why do, uh, do I have Pericles? Yes, Pericles down here as well. Pericles B2. Um, Pericles is much more complex than Churchill. Churchill we found quite, even though I made a lot of mistakes, we found it easier to learn than Pericles. Um, but they're both going alongside each other as two great, oh, there's a fifth title as well. There is Triumvi and Congress of Vienna, uh, the Napoleonic one, which I don't know, I haven't even looked too closely at that, but I have backed Triumvi, it's still on P500. The Roman theme, because um, yeah, one of my friends is a Roman historian and he'd be keen to probably play more of that than he does of, of Churchill. Triumph from Tragedy, block game on the Second World War, was a disaster in my group. I'm putting this in the C tier. Um, I recognise it's a good game, but we went through the entire, we played it once. We went through the entire Second World War without war breaking out. Just lots of diplomacy, everyone was afraid to attack. A block game, so you don't know where things are. Um, I know, I can, I've seen other people play it, it looks fascinating, people rave about it, but it just kind of really fell flat with my group. We did not have a good experience <clears throat> staring across the table uh, for two hours or so. So, yeah, CT for me. The US Civil War, great experience. Um, this is the GMT Games version. Um, it is the most recent second edition from 2022, designed by Mark Samanich. Brilliant, 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 strategic. Uh, I feel that the game, the huge scale, so the map is, you know, the map of the USA up to Tennessee, um, it's just past the Mississippi River, but um, it captures the feeling of the US Civil War at a strategic scale. Um, you know, I feel like you've got, some people have said you can't quite replicate the, Sh the Valley campaigns, Shenandoah Valley, I, I I think you can. I think I saw, you know, things like that playing out like that on a bigger scale. But um, yeah, I, I was so impressed. I, I This is one of the games where I played it through, loved it, started all over again, played it through, loved it. Did I play it three times in a row, maybe? Um, it was just so captivating and S-tier design. Well done, Mark Sunich. Another coin game, the... Um, the Liberty or Death, uh, very close to an AT. It's one of my favorites. I've got Fire in the Lake up here, um, but another one that my friend, one of my friends doesn't like. He doesn't like this theme all that much, so we haven't played it as much as we have others. So probably deserving of AT, but it's going B T purely because we haven't played it as much as we have the others. That's probably not fair. Um, I've really enjoyed this. It's probably very close, probably an A minus experience for me, but putting it in the B T. F A B the bold. I used to play a lot of this, uh, and I really soured on it. Um, it's probably the least bulge esque game in the bulge series. It's very close to a D T for me. Oh look, I'll put it in C T to be kind. It's a. I've mentioned in the in the past my bias against block games. This to me just doesn't feel like the Battle of the Bolt. Um, interesting game. Um, yeah, it's a... a C- minus for me. I have lost my camera, I apologise. Hope you can bear with it. Okay. Oh, I can probably turn it back on again. If I can find it. Yes, there we go. Uh, okay. So yeah, look, block game doesn't really capture, I think, the theme. But, you know, fast action battles, FAB, fast action battles, it, it, it spawned, I think, there's another title on Sicily. There may be others that I never really looked into beyond the bold. I did play this quite a lot. Played probably a dozen games or so when it was first released. Okay, uh, Falling Sky, the Gallic Revolt against Caesar. A friend really loves it. I'm gonna put it in the B tier. Um, and probably one of the, the coin games that we played the most. Um, you know, big Roman army marching up through Gaul, then retreating in winter, then doing it again. Um, yeah, I like it. Uh, just fall shy of A tier for me. I'm trying to put my finger on why. Probably because it's been a while since we actually played that title. Very fond memories every time we play it. It's an interesting, very sort of dynamic game. 
uh, but BT. Maneuver. Um, this game is, is really underrated and deserves more credit. Let me have a look at what Maneuver is rated. Um, <clears throat> first published in 2008, I rated a 7. Um, 7.3, a lightweight game. I told my daughter to play this just two weeks ago. She had a lot of fun. Um, really quite easy. If I show you the, um, the images, quite an, an abstract type game with some really interesting tactical decisions going on. Um, again, more focus on game play and having fun than simulating anything in particular. Every, you have eight um, asymmetric armies. Every army feels different. The French have these big infantry forces they bring to bear. The, the uh, Americans are good at guerrilla warfare and traps and things like that. So a solid B tier game. Conquest of Paradise. Look, I'm going to put this in the DT. Apologies. I bought it when it first came out. I had a friend who was researching kind of Pacific history. Yeah, none of us um, really enjoyed it. I'm sure there's a solid game there. Kevin McPartland, 6.9. Moderate complexity. Um, it just kind of fell flat with our group. I can't say too much about it because it's been probably 16 years since we played it. Um, but yeah, have memories of not liking this and, and passing it on quite quickly. Time of Crisis, people are going to hate me for this, but this is going in CT. I don't like Time of Crisis. My friends love it. I've mentioned one of my friends is a Roman historian, uh, picks up all Roman-themed games. He loves this game. I have rated this a 6 out of 10. Um, I just It's kind of card-driven, area control Roman armies with weird stuff going on. It just... I, I don't like it. I don't know. I can't quite put my finger on it. Um, you've got this kind of scripted opening. So your first three or four moves have to be, you must do this, you must do that, you must do that for the optimal opening. And I forget what that scripted opening is every time. And I find it frustrating that in a lightweight game, a three out of five midweight game, you know, you have to remember this kind of scripted opening. You may as well give you a script where they say, do this, do this, do this. Anyway. Probably, people are probably going to hate me for that, but uh, Time of Crisis goes in C tier. SPQR. Huge fond memories of playing this. Great, great battles of the ancient world. Richard Berg, Mark Herman. Um, great battles of history. Just the base, great battles of history. Um, so many battles, so fun to play. Works well solitaire. I've got it on the. Sh I picked. I kind of sold this years ago, when I lost my opponent to play this with, um, and then thought, well, look, I'll, I'll get it back and start playing solitaire. I picked this up from the GMT sale last year. It's in shrink on the shelves behind me. One day I'll crack this out and fight some of these battles. Um, I don't have Julius Caesar here. Great battles of Julius Caesar, but it would go up there as well. Similar, you know, <clears throat> um, same same rules basically. Colonial Twilight, easy A tier, if not S tier. Um, two player coin game, brilliant. Um, it, it, it takes, you know, coin and puts it, gives it two players rules and it works so close to S tier for the ability to play coin with two players. Um, yeah. The theme kind of put me off for a while. I bought this, had it sitting on the shelf saying, I don't really want to fight the French Algerian War. And then a friend said, let's play some coin two players. I said, well, let's try this. We did, loved it. The system works really well, two players. The, the tweaks that have been made. So if you like coin, but you've only got two players, get Colonial Twilight. While I'm on this theme, let me find, because I know it's in this list here somewhere. Where is... Uh, I can't find it. The Russian one. Uh, where is it? Maybe I've missed it. Anyway, we'll might come back to that later. 1989, Making of the President. Wonderful game. A tier. It's a card-driven game based on the 1960... What did I say? Did I say 1989? This is 1960, The Making of the President. Based on the 1960 presidential election, card-driven game. You control Nixon and Kennedy uh, moving around the USA, campaigning, engaging in debates. Um, really flavorful historical text on the cards. Um, you count the votes, the electoral votes at the end. You have an election. Uh, if you're looking for a two play, fast playing, a good introduction. So I taught my daughter how to play this as a pathway to card driven games. She had fun. 
Uh, my wife used to play this. Good pathway to more complex card-driven games. This plays in, and I've introduced a lot of friends to this game as well. Um, so yeah, so good pathway, good introduction, easy to teach and learn. Here I Stand used to be one of my favorite games. I used to rank this 10 until I played two or three games in a row where one player drew um, Diplomatic Overture and Copernicus. I'm just like, wow, it's really frustrating that I'm, as because I'm often playing the Pope because they're the hardest faction to play and I have a lot of experience. And I'm drawing these one and two op cards and this person's drawing these five op cards to race out on victory points. And it's really soured in recent years. It would, you know, five, six years ago, it'd be up here. Now, now it barely makes B tier. I'm going to say B tier for the memories, but my group is in no rush to return to this anytime soon. And while I'm there, I'll put version coin alongside it because it doesn't really solve many of those, those issues. Um, yeah, this is, I'm, this is why I'm really a fan of card-driven games where you have your own deck. All right, so Paths of Glory, for example, Central Powers deck, allied deck, you draw from your deck, you know that the deck is balanced. Um, Hannibal Rome versus Carthage suffers from this problem. Where is Hannibal Rome versus Carthage? Tell me I've got it in this list somewhere. I'm not sure, but suffers from the same problem, um, but mitigates it to some extent. There are still that those super powerful cards. Um, Messenger intercepted, I think, from memory. But yeah, that's why it's going in BT. Twilight Struggle. Um, Oh, look, I've said that I used to, I played this when it first came out. It was a gateway to the hobby for me. Played it a lot, got sick of it, really didn't like it. In recent years, it's seen a bit of a resurgence for me. I appreciate it's a good game. Solid, used to be number one on Board Game Geek. Going in the B tier. Clash of Giants. Uh, this is Clash of Giants 1. Um, look, a nice Hex Encounter. Um... I don't think there's anything particularly special about it. Is this Clash of Giants 1? Yeah, it is Clash of Giants 1. Campaigns of Tannenberg and Naman by Ted Racer. I have a lot of Ted Racer designs. He's one of my favourite designers. Uh, what can I say? Look, it's, 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 it's good. It's a focused kind of hex encounter, traditional type of thing, but nothing particularly special about it. Um, Pendragon. combat mechanics in Pendragon. It's my biggest criticism of that title. It is overly complicated. Go back to Andy and Abyss and Cuba Libre, even, um, uh, where is it? Yeah, look, most other titles. Nothing, nothing has a combat mechanic as complex as Pendragon. I don't think it's necessary. It just slows everything down and everyone goes through, well, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this, and then I lose the battle so I won't fight in the first place, and it's just annoying. Successes. Now, this is the old uh, Successes, published by GMT Games. It's been so long. I'm going to put this alongside the Napoleonic Wars. I honestly cannot recall too much about it. I know I said that I'm familiar with these games. We haven't played the new Successes yet. A friend has had it, uh, waiting to be played, but yeah, there it is. All right, moving towards some um, Mark Simonich games. Holland 44, I think I've said, people are going to hate me. It's my least, one of my least favourites. In the series prone to you know swings just a couple of dice rolls for those bridge demolitions and if they go badly the allies are screwed and I don't like that idea um, that there's you know there's nothing you can do because the bridge is blown and you have to detour and the bridge is blown and the detour and the bridge is blown and yeah um, my chances of success failure are screwed because of a couple of lucky die rolls on the bridges so this is going into the CT for me cataclysm um, uh, another interesting game. It's going C tier for me. Um, the reason being, it's a hugely complex game. It takes a long time to learn how to play. Very long gameplay, four to five hours. But you know, for me, the crux of this game is that the, your timing is critical. You have to time your transition to different war statuses kind of bet, the, perfectly. And the game kind of comes down to who can time their offensive best. Um, 
there's a lot going on. There's all these back and forth diplomacy. And then the kind of, yeah, the warfare is heavily abstracted. <clears throat> um, if I can bring up at uh, Clism, if I can bring up the actual, oh my goodness. If I can bring up a view of the map, you'll see that like France is, where is France? Here we go. France is divided into like four territories. You've got an army here, infantry, yeah, heavily abstracted. Um, interesting, just not a lot of fun and kind of moves quite slowly. Pursuit of Glory, wow, uh, this is a really hard one because it's a fascinating game to play, not A tier. I'm gonna look at this B tier. Um, kind of wish this would be simplified a little bit. It's just two, it takes Pass of Glory and it adds Chrome. And I feel like a lot of that Chrome could be cut out to make a, an easier game to play that would still be just as interesting. You know, you've got really the Ottoman Empire at the center of the map fighting wars on all these fronts. Um, it's the Russians, um, the Greeks and allies up in Salonika, and allied forces down in, um, in Egypt, the British and so forth. And, and anyway, um, fascinating subject theme, but lots and lots of chrome. Fields of Fire, a game that I've covered and reviewed and played through. I know I said in this review that, you know, it didn't really work for me. I found it really frustrating that the game was prone to these wild swings of luck. Here I am in a mission about to win and then suddenly a card gets drawn and there are German re uh, ambush in my rear and I don't control all these areas so I lose the mission and I just found that kind of frustrating. I've mentioned in the review my frustrations with artillery and this kind of volume of higher rules and I understand it, but uh, yeah, frustrating. So, but but recognizing what a brilliant design it is, um, concerns also about the rule book. It's very hard to, to understand. There are some wonderful playthroughs. Um, Rough Swordsman has done a, quite a few um, and I, that's the best way to learn, just by watching other people play. That's how I learned. I found it easier to watch other people play and learn than I did by uh, reading the rule book. Fort Sumter, I'm sorry, Mark Herman, I think you're a brilliant designer, but I just didn't like this. Um, didn't like it, can't say much about it. Very light, sort of, um, what's it, what's it uh, Fort Sumter, 2018, it is 1.82, so lightweight. You can see 6.5. Just you know, two-player card-driven game-ish. But um, yeah, I, I can't say too much about it. Look, too simple, I think. These are the areas where you're placing um, cubes. Here's a game in action. There's just not enough going on. I know it's light. It's meant to be fast, but it didn't really capture my my attention. France 40, solid Simonich. Um, good introduction to the. Uh, the, you know, Simmons' 1940 X series. Um, you know, nothing too big. There's actually two maps, two scenarios in this one. Two different maps, two different scenarios. A great game to get into. Um, Space Core. Solid B game, uh, BT game. I did a review on this quite recently. You know, if you want space exploration, <coughs> excuse me, and industrialization and development, um, uh, it's not, uh, it's, um, I want to say Ted Racer, it's not Ted Racer, it's, I've forgotten his name, uh, Space Corp, um, RAF, uh, 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 Butterfield, John Butterfield, I forgot, sorry John, um, yeah, good solitaire system with it as well, alright, now we head to the East Front series. And this is really hard for me because I think this series is brilliant and I want to put it in the A tier, but I hate the air rules so much. And I have, over the last year, thought, I want to play East Front again. And then I've gone, oh, but I don't want to have to manage the air rules. And so I've, I've stopped. I've even got to the point where I think I've taken it out, saying, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do um, Army Group South again. And then I'm like, no, oh, I don't want to have to worry about the, the air rules again. So it's... It's going B tier, B tier, B tier. Um, I have played, I'm sure I've played the others, but they're not here anyway. 
So they're going BTU, they would be ATU if they had more streamlined air rules. Simple as that. They might even be STU if they had really streamlined air rules. I don't want to have to manage the damage inflicted to particular aircraft squadrons and have to roll for their repair and refit and move them up this chart. I'm not going to get started, but that really, it really slowed down my experience of playing the game and really frustrated me that I was having to manage all this side repairs whilst I wanted to focus on driving on the eastern front. There is no question, I'm going to put this right at the front, my favourite game of all time, Paths of Glory. Okay, it is not a great historical simulation of the First World War, but it is an amazing game experience. It's a very difficult game to learn. You're going to, for your first five games, struggle. The problem is not many people can afford the time to learn to play five games just to learn it. Um, back in the old days, I had that time and I could invest the time and I played a lot online. And so it was easy to invest that time and play Paths of Glory. If someone said, let's play this game, it goes for seven hours and let's play it five times before we figure out how it works, I'd be like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, but if you, if you can, it is the greatest game ever. Just a wonderful tension constantly throughout the course of the game. Wonderful backs and forths and surprises and you know, the tension of not knowing what your opponent has in your hand, drawing hand, a, a bad hand, but knowing that your deck is balanced so it'll all balance out in the end and all these kind of things and so much going on. I love it. Paths of Glory. Um, I thought I'd love Ted Racer, Paths of Glory, Ted Racer, The Great War. I thought I'd love The Great War, but I didn't. Um, Hex Encounter, three, three kind of theatres. You've got the Western Front, the Eastern Front, and the Near East. It's going in the C tier. Uh, why? Why? Why did I like it? Um, it just felt a bit loose with kind of supply rules. And I think that's one of the main criticisms is that, criticisms that people have, have leveled at it is that you know, the supply system doesn't work. From memory, and it's been a while, but you have to draw a supply back to a town. And you can capture a town and then draw supplies. And you can kind of have these breakthroughs by just linking up with these towns scattered throughout the map. But it just kind of didn't make sense. I probably miss remembering that, but I just remember the kind of control and supply elements felt broken. Um, so one little breakthrough was all you needed to kind of tear an army apart. Um, it was great that it covered such a broad area and you're playing Hicks and Camera across the, the Western Front, but uh, yeah. Nevsky, um, recent discovery for me, part of that levy and levy and control, levy and command. I'm going to put this in the 80. I only have Nevsky and I feel that that's all I need. It's interesting. I think it's a brilliant series. Nevsky, Chuchons and Rus in Coalition, Volko Runke, um, 3.97. It's actually not that complex a game. Uh, levy and Campaign Series. There are now a few titles in this Levy Campaign Series, and any one of these would be brilliant, but I have seven titles. Look at that. Um, but I feel that I get the Levy and Campaign experience from Nevsky, and that if I'm going to sit down and play uh, a Levy and Campaign game with a friend, that Nevsky is, is good enough. I don't really feel the need for diversity, unless you're particularly drawn to, you know, the War of the Roses uh, or the Ark and Core campaign, things like that. You could pick up these titles, but um, Nevsky gives me that that great experience of the Levian campaign series. Right up there as well is Stalingrad 42. Not quite S tier, but very close to it. Um, yeah, I've, I've covered this in review, a couple of gameplay videos, you can check those out. Um, uh, you very much simpler maps than any other title in the 1940X series. And that might be just what's holding it back from S tier, is the kind of relatively bland looking map. Um, it focuses your attention on your units and the front and all that kind of stuff. Ted Talkers is 1989. Um, yeah, solid card driven game. Uh, B tier, what can I say, like Twilight Struggle with elements, the combat mechanism from Hannibal Rome versus Carthage weaved into tri uh, Twilight Struggle. Um, and it works, it's really interesting, uh, focusing on the, the um, fall of communism in the East. Imperial Struggle, the successor to Twilight Struggle, but a vastly different and in my opinion vastly improved gameplay. Do I put it S or A? 
what do I write? What do I write? Uh, Imperial, what do I write? Imperial struggle on board game geek. Let's have a look. I rate it a nine. Uh, is that worthy enough of eight S tier? Um, no, it'll fall just short on an A plus. Um, look, everything I've said about Twilight Struggle, I think this is a far better game. If don't don't let your as I did, don't let your feelings about Twilight Struggle influence your feelings about what Imperial Struggle might be like. It's a very different game and so much better in my opinion. Here it is, All Bridges Burning, the three player coin game. Um, so I did a playthrough, I did a review, I said it's good for three players. Um, after further, after some thinking about this, um, I'm putting it CT. Um, just as a coin game, why is this? Because the blue player doesn't have a lot of fun in the middle. You've got the reds and the whites, and blue not doing much. And yeah, it's a three-play coin game, but that third player isn't having a lot of, of fun. So they are there. Gonna to have to start rushing through these other ones. Caesar, Rome versus Gore, AT, very close to ST, A plus, Mark Simic again. Um, successor to Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. I think it's more fun than Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. It's certainly more dynamic and has, um, <clears throat> because of the way the Gallic tribes come out, you know, the Romans could be focused on the western part of Gaul. It could be focused up in Belgai. It, it creates a different um, issue for the Romans to have to confront. So every time you play this game, it will play out very differently. Compare that to Hannibal Rome versus Carthage, where you have to get Hannibal across the Alps and into Italy. That's the story. Hannibal is kind of like on rails, whereas Caesar Rome versus Gaul is kind of, you've got all of Gaul to open up. A Time for Trumpets. I was talking about this just recently. Brilliant game design. Um, what have I rated this? Because I think my, my feelings have kind of gone up and down. It's a seven. I only rate this a seven. That's not fair. I should adjust that to at least an eight. Because um, why did I rate this a seven? Maybe I got frustrated with one of the campaigns. The last campaign I fought um, may have been sort of frustrating. I'm going to put it 80 uh, as a heavy, complex game that really captures the feeling of the Battle of the Bulge in unparalleled detail. No game, I think, it's fair to say, would go into this much detail, not Wacht am Rhein. Granted, the Wacht am Rhein maps are better. I love the Wacht am Rhein maps, but I feel that... Oh, am I being unfair here? Because I haven't played enough of Wacht am Rhein. Um, point is, A tier game. Bayonets and Tommyhawks, um, sadly, just didn't have enough, haven't had enough time to play this with an opponent. Great game. Um, Two-player, French and Indian War. Uh, probably more, you know, if you, if you like Wilderness War, which I spoke about earlier, here, then you might like Bayonets and Tom Hawks even better. It's just a modern, more modern design, more interesting design. Um, still has a bit of a card-driven element, but not the traditional card-driven ideas, something quite different and innovative. Worth checking out. Beautiful box design, beautiful component design, really evocative feeling, and I think captures the feeling of the French Indian War more than Wilderness War does. Um, yeah. Atlantic Chase, S tier. Hugely innovative design, just so different, um, and great to see designers just trying, you know, interesting new things. Jeremy White, designer, of course. Beautiful rulebook design, beautiful structure to scenarios. Uh, you know, learning the game is a story in itself. Um, outstanding. The Caucus campaign, uh, I'm putting this down alongside Holland 44 as one of my least favourite um, of, of Simic's 1940X series. Um, the first one I played, I think the first kind of game in the series. I just didn't like it that much from memory and just pass it on quite quickly. So whilst I love the series, I no longer, hold, no, no, no longer own the Caucasus campaign. Um, worth checking out if you're interested in that campaign itself, but I think most of the titles in that series are, are better by Simonich. The Dark Summer, Ted Racer. I don't know why there's a K now next to that B. I must have clicked it. I'm putting this B tier. Um, because it's, it's more of a game, than a simulation and more of a game than Normandy 44. 
I'm gonna put normally 44.8 8 here. You know, I've compared these these two, and I said they're both on par, but I, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot over the last 12 months, and these, so the Dark Summer, um, haven't played the Dark Valley quite enough. Where are the others, and why aren't they here? Oh, because they're not published by GMT Games. They are prone to swings of, of chip draw luck, and they just brings it down from the 80, whereas normally 44 is just a, a great experience less prone to those same swings of luck. Flashpoint, South China Sea. Um, I'll put it high B tier, B plus. Um, again, you know, it's, it's been likened to Twilight Struggle, but it really is a unique game and deserves its own sort of attention. Um, really interesting card, sort of driven map manipulation type of game. Space Empires 4X. I'm going to put this CT. Um, I like this more than my friends did. They played it and never wanted to play it again. I played it and liked it and am keen to try it again. Probably will never will because we played a friend's copy and he doesn't want to play again. And my video is now completely dead and flat. <clears throat> uh, Ukraine 43. Solid, solid, solid. Simonich 43 design. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, Combat Commander. Uh, it's just fallen so flat with me. I'm gonna put this D tier. This, that'll frustrate a lot of people I know because it's such a popular game, so many expansions. But I've, you know, I've tried to get into it a few times. I tried to get into Combat Commander several times. I currently own the Pacific, but it's on the trade list because I just, uh, look, this is my bias against tactical games as well. I generally don't enjoy tactical games, so there's a huge problem with me rating this, but for me personally, it's going down here. Skies above Britain. Uh, I'm going to say a pl uh, B+. Plus. Very close to A tier. One of the best solitaire-driven games I've played. Um, why is it just falling shy of A? I can't quite explain. It just doesn't quite. I don't know. It's um, you know, the skies above the Reich, storm above the Reich, skies above Britain. They're all wonderful. Um, it just falls shy of being really strong for me personally. Battle Line, a light card game. Nothing too special about it. It's, uh, really, nothing too special about it. C tier. Leaping Lemmings. Uh, is it a war game? No, I used to own it. Didn't have a lot of fun with it. D T. Uh, it was this Grand Illusion, I think it's called. Uh, a large hex-based strategic game on the First World War. Grand Illusion, Mirage of Glory, 1914, 6.9. It also fell very flat with me. I picked this game up when I was first getting into war gaming, published in 2004, and it really kind of Turned me off hex encounter gaming for a while. So you can see the Western Front is broken for these huge hexes. It just didn't feel like it was capturing the Western Front for me. Um, so yeah, DT. Dominant Species, uh, a kind of a Euro game published by GMT Games. Uh, yeah, interesting game mechanics, Euro game mechanics. Um, it was probably innovative for its time, and a lot of people loved it. I thought it was okay. C tier. Commands and Colours Napoleonics. Um, I'm going to put this B tier. It doesn't quite fall within the A tier of the original, um, but still, yeah, great game. Really captures you know, some, some special rules that help capture the, you know, the aspects of Napoleonic warfare. Um, very similar gameplay to Commands and Colors Ancients, really. And finally on the list, Labyrinth, the War on Terror. Uh, going and sitting up here alongside Twilight Struggle. Um, solid gameplay, uh, but it's been a while since I've played this as well. So this is where it could possibly be higher had I more recent memory of, of playing it. Uh, so folks, to wrap up, there we go. I've got Paths of Glory, Identity 44, the US Civil War, and Atlantic Chase in my S tier. Uh, as you know, four outstanding games. I've got uh, Commands and Colors Ancients, Three Days of Gettysburg, Fire in the Lake, the 1914 series, SPQR, you can add um, Julius Caesar up here as well, Colonial Twilight as the only coin game up here, 
1960, making it the president. Nevsky, Stalingrad 43. Caesar, Rome versus Carthage. Rome versus Gaul, sorry. Imperial struggle, a time for trumpets, and Normandy 44. And all the rest down below. Um, that's very personal, hugely subjective. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, intrigued by what you think. What do you think? Where is injustice here in my ranking system? What have I got terribly wrong? What do I need to make another look at? Folks, give me your feedback, and thanks for watching.